let's have a look at problem 5-3-A, the percentage of sales method. So this question is the first in a series that we look at what happens, how do we account for the fact that some customers who owe us money aren't going to pay? And how do we deal with the reality that we don't know who, right? We don't know who's going to go bankrupt. We don't know who's going to dispute their bill. We don't know who isn't going to pay. But if you're owed a lot of money by a lot of people, somebody ain't paying. And what we do is we estimate that amount. And there's two different ways we're going to learn in this chapter. In problem 5.3, we'll learn the simpler of the two methods, the percentage of sales method. In 5.4, we'll learn the aging of receivables method. A little more complicated, but I like it a little better. But let's jump into the first one, the simpler method, the percentage of sales method. Let's read through our problem and let's solve. Salazar Inc. shows the following information on May 31st, 2029, the company's fiscal year end. They got some receivables. They got this allowance for doubtful accounts account, and it's one we haven't seen so far. I'm going to explain it in great detail at the end of this video. Once we've solved, this is a little bit out of order. I know I'm going to sort of work through the problem. You'll hopefully be working through it with me. And then at the end, when we're wrapping it up, when we, everything sort of falls into place, that's when I'm going to explain in detail kind of what's going on. Uh, so accounts received below 235. We got an allowance for doubtful accounts with a debit balance of 2000 sales, 448 of cash sales, 1850 in total sales. And it says the company's account estimates bad debts to be 2% of credit sales. Now that's important. And that's kind of interesting already. Why credit sales and why not cash sales? And the answer is because we're going to collect the cash sales. We've already collected them. I don't need to worry about the collectability of a cash sale. The person came in and gave me cash. So we got to first figure out, well, what are my credit sales? If my total sales were 1850, now sometimes students see this under the credit column and they think, oh, is that credit sales? No, no, no. That's just debits and credits. That's different, right? Credit sales are sales on account. So uh, if I have 1850 in total sales, And my cash sales were uh, 448. Well, we can fill in the blank here and say credit sales were just the difference. Well, 1850 minus 448. What is that? 1402. I'm going to use a smaller font on my pen. I'm not happy with the pen size. Make it one notch smaller. Uh, okay, so our credit sales are 1402, and the accountant says 2% of credit sales. That's a number that's going to be important. 1402 times 0 0.02, 28040. So times 2% is 28040. When you do the percentage of sales method, when you take a percentage of your sales, which we just did, a percentage of our credit sales, the number you calculate, the answer is your bad debt expense for the year, or for the period, whatever period you're looking at. So in this case, 28040 is going to be our bad debt expense we're going to record. The journal entry looks like this. So part A says prepare an adjustment. The number we calculate goes right into the adjustment. So for part A... The journal entry is debit on, on uh, May 31st, debit bad debt expense 28040. And we credit this allowance account. And again, I'll explain the allowance at the end of part B here. And I allow students just to write allowance. It should be allowance for doubtful accounts. A lot of professors do AFDA, allowance for doubtful accounts. I think that's totally appropriate as well. But there we go. We've got our beautiful adjustment. So done. Part A is correct. Part B says, show how accounts receivable net is going to be disclosed. And this is the first time this chapter talking about the concept of net stuff. We, we talked about this in chapter one with uh, equipment. We said equipment minus accumulated depreciation is equipment net. Well, the same thing is true for receivables. We say accounts receivable minus not accumulated depreciation minus the allowance for doubtful accounts equals AR net. 
And now's as good a time as any to explain this allowance account. Allowance is a contra asset account. It's an account saying, this is what I don't think I'm gonna be able to collect. So accounts receivable, this is what I'm legally owed, but based on track record, again, if a hundred people each owe you a thousand dollars, you know, you're not going to get a hundred thousand dollars. Some of them aren't going to pay for one reason or another. And so the accountant has to estimate how many people aren't going to pay. The allowance is that estimate. So I'm legally owed a hundred thousand dollars. I allow for 3% not to pay. So that's $3,000 allowance for doubtful accounts. I only think I'm going to collect $97,000. AR a hundred minus allowance of three equals AR net of 97, for example. But let's apply that to this situation. We'll discuss it with this company. Our AR right here, 235, just at the top of the question there, our AR is 235. Our allowance for doubtful accounts, you might think, oh, 28040. No, no, no. We have a T account for the allowance because the allowance had an opening balance of $2,000 debit. We've just credited it by 28040. Meaning I have 20, oops, wrong side. I end with, take the big side minus the small side, 28 minus two is 26,040. I end with a $26,000 credit balance in the allowance, which is why it works against their AR. AR is a debit, the allowance is a credit. It's a contra asset, 26,040. So 235 minus 26,040 equals 208. 960. Our net accounts receivable is 208,960. So let's explain that last piece again. I explained it with the hypothetical $100,000 example, but here's the more real example. I'm legally owed $235,000 based on work I've already done and billed. Uh, based on track record, though, I know not everybody's going to pay. I estimate, I'm going to allow for the fact that in the future, $26,000 of this 235 is going to go back based on my estimates. So how much do I actually think I'm going to get? Well, I actually only think I'm going to get $208,000, 208,960. That's the number shareholders care about. They don't care about what you're legally owed. They care about what you actually think you can get. That's the asset. The asset isn't like money you're never going to see. The asset is money you think you can collect. So when we look at real companies, I just called down Apple's uh, balance sheet and just, you know, under current assets, the only thing I wanted to point out, not even the numbers, just real companies don't list accounts receivable. They list accounts receivable net. And that's what they're talking about. They've already taken out that allowance for doubtful accounts on their balance sheet. And that's what we're going to do on our balance sheet when we prepare one in chapter six, right? We'll, we'll have the concept of AR net fresh in our mind. So you'll see that in chapter six. Um, but the, the concept's important for this chapter. Our AR, what I'm legally owed, minus allowance, the fact that I'm estimating what I'm not going to be able to collect out of what I'm legally owed equals AR net. Okay, on to part C. On June 23rd, 2029, the company writes off a $1,400 receivable from a customer. Okay, if I want to write off a receivable from a customer, you just credit the receivable. So C, sorry, this is B here, right? This part is B. Uh, C says, again, we want to write off AR from a customer. So I credit AR to say, okay, I'm writing it off. That's how you write something off. You credit the asset to write it off. AR, customer, you you know, give the customer name. Um, $1,400. The debit, the tempting debit here on June 23rd is bad debt expense, but we know that's wrong. We don't debit bad debt expense when we write off a bad debt. That's called the direct write-off method. It's not allowed. We're doing the allowance method, which is allowed under GAAP. And we, whenever we write off a bad debt, we use up our allowance. So we debit allowance for doubtful accounts for the amount that we wrote off. Okay, we have fully solved 5-3-A. Just a quick aside before we move on here. Sometimes students ask me, they go, well, wait, why is this allowance a debit of 2000? If it always ends in a credit, it's always a negative asset. Like, you know, uh, accumulated depreciation is never a debit. Accumulated depreciation always is a credit. It always reduces the value of our asset. Allowance always reduces the value of our AR. How could we have allowance be a debit? And the answer would be, well, like, let's say this year, I have an allowance of $26,000. 
every time I write off a bad debt, I debit the allowance. If I wrote off $30,000 in bad debts because more customers went bad than I estimated, I'm going to end with a debit in my allowance. How do I fix that? How do I repair it? Next year, rather than 2%, maybe I have it to take 3% or 4 right? You just change your estimate prospectively. You change your estimate going forward. You don't have to go back in time and fix it. You just go, okay, next year I'm going to make a bigger estimate. But that's how you'd end up with a debit balance in your allowance. Kind of a quirky situation, but it does happen all the time. And what else would I love to happen all the time? Thumbs up, smash those buttons. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Next video, allowance for doubtful accounts calculated, the aging of receivables method. I like that method better. And it, you know, this method's great. The next method, even better. Can't wait to get started there. Bye-bye. The next video in our series is right up here. And if you want a supercut of all of the videos in this series, that's the one down below.